Bibles to the book of John. By the way, if you need a handout, Ron has a few back there. Uh, Gospel of John, chapter 15. So here we are sort of uh, working our way through eternal security. Um, Is it true that once saved, always saved? (laughs) I'm giving you, first of all, in the first part of this class, the pro-eternal security argument, which I hope we're going to finish today. I have 13. So by way of review, because self-righteousness did not save us in the first place, it's not a basis upon which salvation can be lost. Number two, salvation is neither given nor maintained by good works. Number three, if a believer can lose his eternal life, then how can his eternal life be what? Eternal. Number four, the promises of the Bible guarantee security. John 10, probably being the strongest. Number five, the assurance of salvation is possible. You know, God wants us to know that we are saved. And if you could lose your salvation, you could never have the assurance of salvation. Number six, the believer is predestined for glory. Number seven, the Spirit's seal on you cannot be broken. Number eight, God keeps us from falling out of His hand. Number nine, Christ is currently interceding and advocating for us. Number 10, Christ's death perfectly dealt with all sins, past, present, and future. Uh, Number 11, a believer can't be removed from Christ's body. Number 12, the Bible never tells you which sins remove salvation. You think the Bible would do that if you could lose salvation. And then number 13, this is where we are right now. Uh, believers with unfruitful lives still lose salvation. Excuse me, said that wrong, didn't I? Just contradict everything I said. Still have salvation, although they lose rewards at the bema seat. So we're focused on number thirteen there. And you see, what everybody says is they say, "Well, if you teach security, then you're not." coming down hard enough on Christians who go back into sin. So a lot of people feel you've got to dangle hell over people every Sunday and Wednesday to get them to live right. Uh, you've got to perpetually threaten them. You know, they're going to lose salvation if they go back into sin. And that really isn't what we believe the Bible teaches. However, that's not to say that if you go back into sin you don't experience consequences because you very clearly do. And so what this slide and the next one really communicate is the consequences that people experience as Christians when they go back into sin. But the consequences, all of them enumerated, are never you're going to go to hell. So to me... Um, when all of these consequences are articulated and the Bible never says, oh, by the way, you're going to go to hell if you commit, go back into sin, that in and of itself is a very powerful argument for the security of the believer. So what we're just looking at here is what do you lose as a Christian when you go back into sin? As we've studied, you lose power, you grieve the Spirit, you lose joy, you lose spiritual sight. You forfeit the opportunity to grow. We spent a lot of time last week saying you move back into carnality. In fact, we spent the whole session talking about carnality because there's a lot of people out there that say there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. And I tried to show you very clearly there is. So carnality is a problem. Something else you lose if you go back into sin is you forfeit fruitfulness. You can become unfruitful. So that's why I had you open up to John 15. 
which is Christ's teaching, and we've done extensive teachings on this when we were uh, teaching the Gospel of John. This is Christ in the upper room. And he begins to talk about branches that are in the vine that bear fruit, branches out of the vine that do not bear fruit. And people that are non-context readers of the Bible look at, a ver- look at verses like that and they say, oh, well, that's the distinction between being a believer and an unbeliever. The believer is in the vine bearing fruit. The unbeliever is out of the vine not bearing fruit. Now, the, one of the key things to understand when you study any book of the Bible or any passage is who is the audience? Who is he talking to? In the upper room, he's not talking to unbelievers, is he? Who's he talking to? He's talking to believers. He's talking to the disciples. In fact, there was only one disciple that was an unbeliever. Who was that? Judas. And back in John 13, verses 29 through 31, Judas had already left to betray Christ, the upper room. So by the time you get to John 15, he's not talking to any unbelievers at all. He's just talking to his 11 hand-picked disciples, all of whom obviously were believers, right? So that's the context of In the vine, out of the vine. Fruitfulness, lack of fruitfulness. So, he is not drawing a distinction here between believer and unbeliever. If you think he's drawing a distinction between believer and unbeliever, you have to ignore who this was said to. He's drawing a distinction between those believers in fellowship and those believers out of fellowship. You with me? So look at, look at verse 5. Um, he says there in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. For apart from you, you can do nothing. And then you go down to verse 8, and it says, My Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. And so prove yourselves to be my disciples. When he talks about a believer or a branch in the vine, he's talking about a believer in fellowship with God. So that would be a believer who has confessed his sin or sins. That's a believer that's trying to live uh, out the Christian life under God's power. That's the believer that's walking in moment-by-moment fellowship with him. And the promise is, if you're that kind of believer, an in-fellowship believer, you know, primarily, not that we're perfect, but we spend the majority of our lives as Christians in fellowship with Him, then fruit, and by the way, it goes on here and it defines fruit that'll last. Fruit comes spontaneously in your life. By contrast, if you're out a branch out of the vine, then you really can't expect a lot of fruit any more than you can expect a branch of an orange tree, for example, that's disconnected from the nurturing sap of the tree to bear oranges. It's just a very simple analogy. So every moment I spend in sin, every moment I spend out of fellowship with God, it's it's, it's not jeopardizing my position in Christ, but what he's saying here is, is I just cannot bear the fruit that God has called me to bear. Because the fruit only comes when it's connected to the nurturing sap of the tree. Now, you say, well, wait a minute here. Doesn't it talk about one of these branches being cut off and being thrown into the fire? Isn't fire always hell? And the answer is fire is not always hell. Uh, For example... There are going to be those at the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ who are believers, but they have spent the majority of their Christian lives with the right foundation, but building with the wrong material. So they're building with wood, hay, and stubble. In other words, they've gone back into carnality. 
And it's very clear there in 1 Corinthians 3.15, we may look at that later, that their works, not them, but their works are put through a fire. What does a fire do? It destroys that which is combustible, wood, hay, and stubble. But that which is non-combustible, gold, silver, and costly stones, which would represent the life in Christ in fellowship, the latter, gold, silver, and costly stones, goes through this fire. But the only thing the fire can do is purify. So uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 15, talks about those who are in Christ that are going to heaven, but they're watching at the judgment seat of rewards. Their life, to a very large extent, going up in smoke and fire imagery is used it says if any man's work is burned up see burning there he will suffer loss but he himself will be what saved so is through fire now i'm going to spend a lot of time uh, when we look at the arguments against eternal security looking at that branch in the fire but one of the things I want you to understand is fire in the New Testament does not always mean hell. Yes, fire typically does mean hell in the New Testament, but there are about three examples I could give you where fire does not mean hell. And by the way, when you look at this branch being thrown into the fire, it, as you study this, it never says, and I've misread this for years and years and years, thinking that that's what it said, but it really doesn't say this. I used to think this said God took the branch and threw it into the fire. But as you study this, you'll see that God in this passage is not the actor in throwing the branch into the fire. What it says is they're like branches that dry up that men gathered and threw into the fire. So let me ask you just a basic question. Would God ever entrust the task of throwing people into hell to mere men? I mean, of course not. So, so we'll spend more time on this branch being thrown into the fire. And I don't believe that that's talking about hell at all. I think it's talking about some kind of temporal discipline either on this earth or perhaps a loss of reward at the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ. Paul uses the imagery of fire to describe that. So I don't think it's hell. More on that later. But the only point I'm trying to make here is <clears throat> if we spend our lives in Christ, not in fellowship with Him, because of unconfessed sin and other things, yes, we're going to heaven, but we just cannot be very fruitful for the things of God. Um, so that's a little bit there on uh, John 15. Unfruitfulness. By the way, there was a disciple that was sitting there in the upper room listening to all this. And who was that disciple? It was the guy who wrote this book called The Gospel of John. John is going to take these same exact truths about in fellowship and out of fellowship. And he's going to put them into his own book that would be recorded about uh, 60 years after he heard Jesus teach these things in the book of 1 John. So 1 John, to understand 1 John, you have to understand the upper room discourse. Particularly, you have to understand John 15. Uh, John 15, as I said before, the whole point of it is not believer versus unbeliever. It's in fellowship, out of fellowship. And remember what Jesus said in the upper room, I have many more things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. Sixty years later, the Holy Spirit would bring to remembrance what John heard in the upper room and would strategically guide him in writing the little book of 1 John, which is simply an amplification, if you will, of the branch and vine discourse. And I say that because 1 John is misunderstood all of the time. 1 John is meant, taught by people to say, well, believer, unbeliever. 
because it poses various tests for righteousness. If you don't have these tests in your life, you're not saved. And that's what you hear 99% of the time through Christian media, Christian literature, those kind of things. And I, I may, may I just say to you that that is not the way church history, by and large, has understood 1 John. And it's not at all in harmony with what John heard here in the upper room. So a little bit more on that later. But what is the consequence of being going back into sin as a Christian? Lack of fruitfulness. What's another consequence? Uh, take a look, if you could, at Matthew 16, verses 24 and 25. And as you're turning there, I'm going to go over to the book of Ecclesiastes for a minute. As you begin to experience a lack of purpose, you know, even though you're going to heaven, even though you're saved, your life really doesn't produce the kind of purpose that God would have it produce. And if you want a whole book about a guy who clearly was saved as the third king of the United Kingdom, Solomon, but his life lacked purpose, you would read the book of Ecclesiastes. Because in that particular book, Solomon, towards the end of his life, was led astray by his many wives, plural. So first of all, he shouldn't have been possessing many wives, right? And a lot of these wives came from foreign countries because that's how treaties were entered into in the Solomonic time period as you were given someone to marry. So he entered into these treaties with these other countries, something he shouldn't have been doing. He was offered the daughter or the princess or something like that of the kingdom that he entered the treaty into. And he entered into all these treaties against the direct will of God. And he had all of these wives. In fact, he had about 700 wives and 300 concubines. And the Bible, and I think it's 1 Kings 11, says as many wives turned him away, his heart away from God. And so what was Solomon experiencing as he was in that condition? He was going to heaven, I, I believe. But he began to experience an emptiness and a purposelessness. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, he says, These are the words of the preacher, the son of David, the king in Jerusalem. And then he says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Life is empty. Life doesn't make any sense. Uh, Life is meaningless. And then in verse 8, he says, all things are wearisome. Man is not able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing. So he was, you know that song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction? I'm going to sing that for you this morning if you don't mind. No. But there's a song, you know, I don't even know who sings it, but this guy just goes on and he goes, I can't get no satisfaction. Uh, what he's saying is, I can't find fulfillment in life. I can't find meaning. I can't find purpose. And unbelievers, of course, are like that. Because your purpose can only come in God, Right? And out-of-fellowship believers are like that. Solomon being a textbook case of an out-of-fellowship believer. And he wrote a whole book called the book of Ecclesiastes under that condition. So you have to sort of be careful about using the book of Ecclesiastes to build doctrinal points. I find a lot of uh, systematic theologians, they try to make a point and they quote the book of Ecclesiastes. And I'm always wondering, well, let's... What's the context there of Ecclesiastes? It's talking about a man, and he calls himself throughout the book as living under the sun. In other words, he's because he's out of fellowship with God because of all of these wives and sin and all of these things he was committing, he didn't have the divine viewpoint in life. So he's expressing his emptiness. So let's be careful about quoting the book of Ecclesiastes. Let's look at the specific context of everything that's quoted in the book of Ecclesiastes because a lot of the things he's saying in Ecclesiastes aren't really good. From the New Testament uh, perspective, that's why I had you turn to Matthew 16, 
verses 24 and 25, Jesus begins to lay down the criteria of discipleship. And it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now look at this, verse 25. Whoever wishes to, to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And then he goes on and he says, What can a man profit if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? But how do you really start to find meaning in life? It's not by gaining your life and grabbing hold of your life. It's losing your life. Now again, I would ask you this simple question. When Jesus said this, who was he talking to? What disciple was he interacting with? He's interacting with Peter. Now Peter had been saved for over three, probably over three years by now. This is towards the end of Christ's ministry. So he's not dealing with the distinction between a believer and an unbeliever. What he's saying, Peter, is now that you're a believer and you have received the gift of God, I'm calling you in now into a deeper walk with me. Well, you're not just a believer, someone trusting in me for your eternity, but you're going to actually follow me even to the point of death if necessary, and that's called discipleship. And in the process of unfolding the doctrine of discipleship, which is a doctrine that can only be aimed at the believer. Only a believer can follow Christ as disciple, right? He begins to say that's how you're going to find purpose in your life. As you lose your life, you're going to discover it. But if you don't follow me in this path called uh, discipleship, then you'll end up losing your own life in the process. You're going to be just like Solomon. And you're going to spend the majority of your life in Christ living outside of finding fulfillment, meaning, and purpose. So the promises of fulfillment is not just for the believer. It's for the believer that cooperates with Christ as a follower. So very clearly there are people that have trusted in Christ as Savior and are on their way to heaven. I would describe the Corinthian church that way. I would describe Solomon that way. But then within the ranks of the believer, there's a smaller group called the disciple, which is actually willing to cooperate with Christ as he empowers us on daily denial to ourselves. And the promise of fulfillment is only aimed at the disciple. So, uh, guess what? Uh, Every moment I spend out of fellowship with Christ, every moment I spend going back into sin is a moment I really can't experience the fulfillment and the meaning and the purpose in life that God has for me. I'm just like Solomon living under the sun with a human, human viewpoint. So, unfruitfulness and lack of purpose. Something else that can happen to us when we go back into sin is a lack of stability. Uh, Notice, if you will, the book of Galatians, chapter 3 and verse 3. We just become unstable. Um, We gravitate towards one false idea after another. Galatians chapter 3, verse 3. Can a believer become unstable? Look at Galatians 3.3. Are you so foolish, having begun in the, what, spirit? Are they Christians? Absolutely, they're Christians. They've begun in the spirit. Are you now being perfected by the flesh? So these folks wandered back into sin. Specifically, they were trying to work out the middle tense of their salvation, progressive sanctification through human power. And Paul basically tells a bunch of Christians that they've become foolish. Uh, Perhaps another way of saying it is they become unstable. A believer can become unstable. Uh, Notice uh, 2 Timothy 2, 
and verse 18, it talks about false doctrine, I believe, coming into the ranks of Christians. It says in 2 Timothy 2, verse 18, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, they have upset the faith of some. Now, you can't have your faith upset unless you have what? Faith. I mean, if someone's upsetting my faith, doesn't that presuppose that I have faith to upset? So it's talking about false doctrine coming into the life of the believer, and it was taking their faith and unsettling it or upsetting it or disrupting it. And you might recall that when we were studying 2 Timothy, particularly verse 18, one of the things I pointed out is this verb translated uh, upset is the same verb used to describe Christ overturning the money changers' tables. Remember when Christ went into the temple and they had turned His Father's house into a place of commerce? He was very upset by that. and He started to literally overturn tables. That's the same word used to describe that here in 2 Timothy. So think of a table being overturned and all the money and coinage you know, scatters all over the floor. That's sort of the imagery that you get of a Christian who moves into false doctrine. In this case, they were tampering with the doctrine of resurrection. They were putting prophecy in the past. Uh, that's called today preterism. Preterism comes from the Latin word uh, past or gone by. There's a whole bunch of people out there today arguing that Bible prophecy has already happened. There is no future Antichrist. The Antichrist was Nero. You know, these kind of arguments. And I know many, many people that drift into that doctrine. And what happens is every moment they spend under that false doctrine their faith is literally being overturned, upset, unsettled, and they're becoming unstable. Uh, one more, if I could do that. One more verse, that is. Look at Second Peter chapter 3, verse 17. Peter writing to two Christians all the way through these two little letters of Peter. And at the very end of Second Peter... Uh, He says this, You therefore, beloved, verse 17. Now when he says beloved, is he talking to believers or unbelievers? Clearly believers. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men. That would be false doctrine. Now look at this. And fall from your own steadfastness. So you'll notice here that a Christian, they're called beloved, can fall from their own steadfastness. Is this talking about loss of salvation? No. What it's talking about is the instability that can be introduced into a person's life when they fall out of fellowship with Christ and wander into false doctrine. So lack of stability is a key problem with the out-of-fellowship Christian. And there are Christians that are very, very unstable. They're unstable in their ministries. They're unstable in their character. They're unstable sometimes in their marriages. And I don't know what it is about unstable Christians, but they fall for one deception after another because they're not rooted and grounded in God's Word. And I've been a Christian since 1983. I know some of you have been Christians longer. But the nice thing about being a Christian over several decades is I've seen several trends come through the body of Christ. Trends that are very, very popular. And everybody seems to jump on the bandwagon. One example I'll give you is the prayer of Jabez. Remember that a few years ago? Runaway best-selling books. Prayer of Jabez study material, and everybody was saying this prayer, you know, almost like a magical incantation of some kind. 
And today, you know, a few years have passed, I hardly hear anything about the Prayer of Jabez. The only thing I hear about is I go to a used bookstore and see a Prayer of Jabez book, and I looked at that and I said, wow, this is in a used bookstore. That was so popular, you know, a few years ago. So it was a trend that just came through. Everybody kind of jumped on it, and then over time people abandoned it. And uh, I've probably seen in the short time I've been a Christian probably four or five major trends like that that have come through. So the unstable Christian is always jumping on board, very enthusiastic, until the trend wears off. So we have this ability as Christians to be very, very unstable. And that's a major consequence of going back to the sin nature. Um, I have some more here. Uh, another list to get through. Um, this has to do with conviction. Conviction. Take a look at Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5. Another consequence of going back to the sin nature is we come under the conviction of God. Why do we come under the conviction of God? Because God knows what is going to destroy our lives. He knows that sin will destroy our lives. And He loves us too much to see us wreck our lives under sin. So if you go back to sin as a Christian, let me tell you from personal experience, God has a tremendous ability to make you feel very uncomfortable and very bad. Now we look at guilt as always bad, but I would say guilt to a large extent functions as pain. If my hand is on a stove that is on and the pain shoots through my hand and prompts me to remove my hand, that pain is not a bad thing. That pain is a good thing because if I keep my hand on that stove, I'll destroy my hand. So the pain actually becomes my friend. So God uh, knows what sin will do to us. We go back into sin and He will just annoy you over that sin. Why? Because He loves you. He doesn't want to see... We don't see what the sin will do. But God does. And this is the condition that Lot... We made reference to Lot last week. Are you a lot like Lot? Remember? He was what I would call a carnal Christian. And God bothered him. Because in 2 Peter 2... uh, 7 and 8, it says, And if he rescued righteous Lot by the sexual conduct of unprincipled men. For by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their righteous, unrighteous deeds. Yeah, a lot went back into sin. There's no question about it. But he was miserable every single moment. He was back in sin. Why is that? Because he was tormented. He was tormented by it. I believe that the torment that he experienced, uh, some of the older Bible translations teach this as the vexing of the soul. I believe that that discomfort that he was experiencing was the no, none other than the convicting hand of God. So there are many times in my Christian life where I'm tempted to go back into sin. And I simply say this, you know what? The last time I did that, the Lord made me feel so miserable about it. And I don't want to feel that bad today. So I think I'll avoid the sin. If you want a textbook case of a man who was convicted by God, it's the story of David. And that's why I had you turn to Psalm uh, 32. Verses 1 through 5, if I have my chronology right, there's about a year or so where David hid his sin. Now, Psalm 51 is the blessings, I think it's Psalm 51, that he experienced when he finally uh, confessed his sin to God. By the way, I say sin, there were multiple sins in David's life. When you study 2 Samuel 11, there was lying, there was adultery, And ultimately, there was murder. And David did what... Was David saved? I think so. He was the first king of the United Kingdom. Um, God said of David, this man's after my own heart later on. 
But David did what most of us do with sin. We just kind of tuck it under the mattress and pretend like it never happened. You know, we hide sin from our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we try to hide sin from God. Is it really smart to try to hide something from God since God knows everything? I mean, it's like we're so self-deceived, the things we do in our sin nature. But David hid his sin. Now, God bothered David all that time period, and David describes it in Psalm 32 one through five, he says, How blessed is he whose transgression was forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. In other words, he was blessed when he finally confessed his sins, plural, to God. Verse three, watch this, when I kept silent. So what was David's life like when he was hiding it? When I kept silent about me, my body wasted away. Second part of verse 3, through my groaning, once in a while, no, through my groaning all day long. Verse 4, for, now why was he groaning? For day and night, that's around the clock. For day and night, your hand, whose hand? God's hand, was heavy upon me. It's his conviction that he's under. And when he was under that conviction, he says, my vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. And then finally, he says in verse 5, I acknowledge my sins to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. But if you want to see a description of somebody and what he's like under the convicting hand of God, just like Lot, when he was hiding his sin from God for about a year, you can get a great description of it there in verses 3 and 4. So what does unconfessed sin do in the life of the believer? It doesn't send you to hell. But God is so good at this convicting ministry that you can actually feel like you're in hell. I mean, there have been times in my life where I've come under the convicting hand of God and it almost seems like, to me, uh, some form of eternal judgment. It's not eternal judgment, but it can feel that way because it's the pain shooting from my, through my body, which is not my enemy, it's my friend. It's telling me to get away from whatever it is I was doing and to get back into fellowship with God. I mean, would you allow your children to wander off into destructive behavior without agitating them and annoying them? Of course you wouldn't. Why would God let you, why would he let me just wander off into sinful, self-destructive behavior without bothering us about it? Something else that happens, let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 19. It's sort of related. We come under the conviction, excuse me, the divine discipline of God. And as we turn there, you might want to just jot down Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11. It's the most in-depth place I know of this doctrine in the Bible, at least in the New Testament. It says, whom the Lord loves, the Lord what? Chastens. And in fact, the book of Proverbs says, if you don't discipline your children, you hate your children. That's an important thing to quote to your kids, because when you discipline them, what do they all say? You hate me. Well, if I hated you, I would just let you do whatever you wanted to do. The fact that I'm disciplining you shows, shows my love for you. So what is divine discipline? It's, I would describe it this way. It's momentary pain applied to somebody by God. So the next time they think about doing that sin, whatever it is, they associate the momentary pain with the sin. And then their hand is kept back from that sin. And as their hand is kept back from that sin, and while it's true that no discipline at the time seems pleasant, as Hebrews 12 tells us, that process of discipline saves our lives from behavior which is sinful and by definition self-destructive. 
the easiest way to analogize it is a kid uh, runs across, your child runs across the street without looking, which, which kids do, right? They don't have any life experience. They don't, they don't know uh, speed limit laws and trucks and cars barreling around the corner at high speeds. They just run across the street because it looks fun. Well, any parent worth their salt will take that child aside and discipline them. Um, there's way, different ways of disciplining. Um, we at our home do use spanking, but we don't use it as a first resort. You know, we use it as a last resort. But spanking, although it's, maybe I shouldn't even say this on the internet, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, you, you, you know, and every, it's weird. You discipline your kids in the, in the, in the store, and, every, and who's everybody look at? They look at you like you're some kind of bad parent. When in reality, when I see uh, someone disciplining their children publicly, I, I almost want to stand up and applaud. Matter of fact, one time Ann in Dallas did discipline Sarah uh, at an amusement park, and this guy just yelled out, All right! You know, it's like so rare to see it. He was, <laughs> he was, he was happy because that's what keeps these, these kids under control. Just like, didn't we have to be disciplined by our parents? I mean, I remember I was, uh, well, I won't get into all that. <laughs> so you, you discipline the child, so the next time they think about running across the street without looking, they remember the discipline. So when they associate the momentary pain with the discipline, they won't run across the street without looking. And guess what just happened in the process? Their life was spared from the truck barreling around the corner and k- killing them on impact. Basic parenting 101, right? Well, if we're God's children, doesn't He do the same thing to us? You go off into sin, God will give you a little tap on the shoulder. Maybe something more than that. So the next time you're thinking about doing it, you remember, wow, I remember that discipline that God gave me. I'll stay away from this sin. And your life is prolonged as a result. And look at what he says here to the church at Laodicea. In Revelation 3, verse 19, those whom I love, I what? Reprove and discipline. Therefore, be, be zealous and repent. It's kind of interesting to me that he makes this statement to the most carnal church of, of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Because people all the time read this and they say, those people weren't believers. How could they be believers? Look at the way they're acting. Of course they were believers because he says in verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So discipline is proof that God loves us. So if you go back into the sin nature, then you become a candidate for uh, divine discipline. And sometimes, and this takes us to the next one, that discipline can be so severe that it can result in the termination of one's life. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 11. Verse 30. Some people God disciplines of His children to the point of death. I don't know how frequently God does it. I'm glad He doesn't do it all the time or else church attendance would be pretty low. But, but there are four cases in the Bible where it happens. The first is Ananias and Sapphira. Acts 5, 1 through 11, who were uh, slain in the Holy Spirit. Now, I have a lot of students coming from the charismatic background that pride themselves on being slain in the Holy Spirit. And I always like to take them aside and I say, you really think that's a good thing to be slain in the Holy Spirit? The only people I know in the Bible that were ever slain in the Holy Spirit were Ananias and Sapphira because they sold property, and they kept back part of the proceeds for themselves. And in the process, they told the whole church, we gave all the proceeds to the church. 
Now, this is a very common misunderstanding. People say, well, God uh, disciplined Ananias and Sapphira because they didn't give all of the proceeds of the sale to the church. And that is not their sin. Because the Bible never comes down on the ownership of private property. In fact, in that context, Acts 5, and you need to understand this because your kids, let me tell you something, in these schools that they're in, they're being taught a Marxist doctrine constantly. And Marxists appeal to the Bible. It's called liberation theology, where you're trying to link Marxism or the principles of communism with Scripture. So all of these 20-somethings are being kind of hit with this Marxist idea, and there are those in the body of Christ, uh, like Jim Wallace and many others I could talk about, that are mixing Marxism with the Bible, and they'll say, look, the early church, they gave up all their property, and they were all equal. The great response to that is the story of Ananias and Sapphira, because Peter who announces the discipline on Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5 and verse 3 um, says, verse 4, while it remained unsold, that's the property, did it not remain your own? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why was God upset with Ananias and Sapphira? He wasn't upset with Ananias and Sapphira because they sold their property and only gave part of the proceeds to the church. That's not the issue at all. That's a complete misreading of the Scripture. The property was theirs. They could do whatever they wanted with it. The sin of Ananias and Sapphira is they sold the property. They gave part of the proceeds to the church, which wasn't the problem, but they told everybody. We gave it all to the church. So their sin was publicly lying. Their sin was publicly misrepresenting their level of generosity. And that's why Peter tells Ananias and Sapphira that you have lied. See the word lie there? You have lied to the Holy Spirit. That was their sin. And the church is very new at this time. It's only started in Acts 2. And if a new virus gets into an infant, as you know from basic biology and medicine, it will destroy the life of that infant. So God here was keeping the church pure by bringing immediate discipline on Ananias and Sapphira, not for their sin in not giving everything to the church. That's not even the point. It's public misrepresentation and lying. That was the problem. And so they were struck dead right there on the spot. And people say, well, they weren't Christians. Let me ask you a question. What were they doing in church if they weren't believers? And then what do you do with verse 11? And great fear came over the what? the whole church, over all who heard these things. The rest of the believers got scared. Now, would a believer be scared if an unbeliever was struck dead? No, that's supposed to happen. But one of our own was disciplined to the point of death. So we better stay away from that particular sin that they were involved in, public misrepresentation, and this discipline to the point of death kept the church pure in its infant form, and allowed this baby infant, this new spiritual organism, to survive. See what God did there? He disciplined them to the point of death. Discipline was very severe, and in this case, it took their very own lives. And I believe that Ananias and Sapphira, once they died, went right into the presence of the Lord. There's no doubt in my mind that these two were Christians or believers. 1 Corinthians 11.30, which is where I had you turn, the same thing transpires. Now remember the Corinthian church was drunk and disorderly at the Lord's table? Uh, In fact, um, if you go back to verse, I think, uh, 
uh, 27, it says, Therefore, who eats this bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And then you go down to verse 30, and it says, For this reason many among you are weak and sick, and a number have what? Fallen asleep, which is a euphemism. Euphemism is a polite way of saying something. It's a polite way of saying death. Paul analogizes all the time the death of the believer to falling asleep because you know that you're, resur- you're going to be resurrected one day and you're going to use that body again. So your condition is temporary. Although your soul is alive and in the presence of the Lord. But here's another example where God disciplined folks in Corinth to the, to the point of some to the point of death. Some he caused to get sick, others died. Now verse 27 is so misread and misunderstood. This is the way it's normally taught. You can't eat and drink of the body and blood of Christ, that's the communion service, if you're unworthy. of the teaching you get on this, that's what they say. So they say, ooh, ooh, you better not have any unconfessed sin in your life. Like sin you committed six months ago, or a year ago, or last week. Because if you come to the Lord's table with unconfessed sin in your life, pow, you could be struck dead. The NASB translates this not as unworthy, but unworthy manner. The better translation is not unworthy, but unworthily. See, is there a difference between unworthy and unworthily? It's it's a night and day difference. Unworthily is an adverb. An adverb modifies a what? A verb. It's like saying Joe ran quickly. The verb is ran, quickly is the adverb, describing how he ran. Why did God bring discipline in Corinth? It's not because they were unworthy. It's because of their, their, they were partaking of the Lord's table unworthily. Which fits the whole context here of 1 Corinthians 11. What were they doing? They were excluding the poor. You have to pay To play, in other words, they set it up in a way that the rich could participate at the Lord's table and the poor couldn't. And they were dividing the body of Christ unnecessarily. Beyond that, they took what was sacred and turned it into a common meal. And that's why Paul says, don't you all have homes where you can eat in? This is the Lord's table. This is not just a common meal. And beyond that, people were showing up inebriated in a drunken state. They had total disrespect for the institution of communion that the Lord set up in the upper room. That's why God disciplined some, made some sick, and disciplined others to the point of death. It had nothing to do with what sin they committed five years ago. It had to do with the manner, this is an adverb, the practice regarding how they were abusing the Lord's table at that specific point in time. See that? That's what God was upset about. And I draw that distinction because if you don't understand that, you'll come to the communion table in fear constantly over some sin you may have committed. I mean, when I was first taught the doctrine you have to come to the Lord's table in a worthy manner, I'm always worried, well, what about some sin I committed sometime in my life that I've forgotten about? Is God going to kill me? Because I... uh, partake of the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. And you see, the laws of language and context rescue you from that fear. It's not unworthy, it's unworthy manner. It's not unworthy, it's unworthily. In other words, if you're coming to the Lord's table with a reverent attitude, then you're not going to be struck dead. So, I just throw that at you because it's another example of people being discipline to the point of death. God does that sometimes. He takes people home early. Uh, One more example of it, Revelation 2, 23. This is the church at Thyatira. 
uh, Revelation 2, uh, really about verse 22, 23. Jesus says, Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. So adultery of some kind, whether it's spiritual or physical, had come into the church at Thyatira. And Jesus says in verse 23, I will kill her. This is in the church. You see this? I will kill her with pestilence. Why? And all the churches will know that I am He who searches the hearts and minds. I will give each one of you according to his deeds. How are we going to purify these churches? Jesus says, well, here's how it's going to work. Some, some of these Christians in these churches that are in sin, I'm going to kill. And that is going to have a purifying effect on all of the churches. It's exactly what's taught in Acts 5, 1 through 11. Because the death of Ananias and Sapphira sent fear throughout the saved world. And they said to themselves, you know, we better stay away from that particular sin because God is apparently is pretty upset about it as evidenced by the fact that he disciplined some believers within the church to the point of death. The only other place I know of this doctrine, and some of you have asked me about this already, is 1 John 5.16, which is the sin that leads unto death. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin leading to death, he shall ask of God, for he will give him life to those who commit sin not leading to death. Look at this. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make a request for this. So there are some... Now, it doesn't say what the sin leading to death is. So every time I teach this, someone raises their hand and says, what's the sin leading to death? I, I don't know. How would I know? It doesn't tell me. The only thing this opens the door to is there are some sins of a peculiar quality that God reserves the right not only to bring discipline into the believer's life, but to actually take the believer home early. So this doctrine is taught not once, not twice, but four times in the New Testament. Acts 5, 1 through 11, 1 Corinthians eleven thirty. Revelation 2, 22 and 23, 1 John 5, 16. Now, in none of these cases is the issue hell. The issue probably would be hell if the believer could lose his salvation. I rehearse this because many people argue that our doctrine of eternal security makes it sound as if we don't take sin seriously. Let me tell you something. God takes sin very seriously. What do you introduce into your life when you move off into sin? Unfruitfulness, lack of purpose, lack of stability, conviction, divine discipline. And in some peculiar and I would say rare cases, even premature death. So didn't quite finish uh, the list today. We'll finish it when we get together uh, the next time we're together. So we'll pause at this point and give folks a chance to uh, take a bathroom break. And if you have a, we have a couple minutes for questions if you have any.